okay, maybe I have you convinced, but surely theists care. I mean, surely the people who aren't liable to come out to an Evansville Freethinkers group, they care whether or not God exists. I mean, after all, they're the ones who, who are devoting their life to God. They're joining the priesthood, they're, they're going to church. You know, and these things clearly matter to these people. Um, and indeed, I obviously don't deny that if you talk to them, if you ask them, they will tell you it matters. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not that deluded. They uh, will say things like God gives them hope, that, that, that God gives them courage, a sense of belonging, a feeling of love, acceptance, etc. and so forth. God, uh, forgiveness, and, and uh, something to give gratitude to. It is the holiday season, giving gratitude at this time, of course, is common. Uh, the, the, the human need to give thanks to something is a very powerful need, and that's something that, that God does for them. Clearly, these people care whether or not God exists. Do they? Uh, I mean, literally, let's, let, let's stop and ask for a moment. Should we just take their word for it? Should we just say, well, they say they care, therefore they do? Uh, if any of you have any exposure to the last 150 years or so of empirical psychology, you should bear some serious skepticism on this. We've got lots of uh, ample evidence to suggest that what people say they care about and what they actually care about are not necessarily the same thing. Likewise, what people say they believe and what they actually believe are not necessarily the same thing. These two things can come apart. So the mere fact that someone claims they, got, they, they care whether or not God exists doesn't necessarily mean that they do. And again, I'm not doubting their sincerity. I'm not saying they're all a bunch of lying hypocrites who are just saying they care when in their heart of hearts they don't. I'm saying that you know, even if they sincerely believe that they care, were they to properly reflect on their own epistemic predispositions and their own personal values, they would find that really at the end of the day it does not make a difference. So what we need here is a test. We need some way of empirically determining whether or not it actually makes a difference to theists, on average, whether or not God exists. And I think there's a pretty simple test, and I want to propose it here. We take a group of theists, we convince them that God does not exist, and we see what happens. Raise your hand if you used to be a theist. Did it make a huge difference? You know, I mean, some ways, perhaps, but I suspect in the ways that really count, it doesn't. Um, uh, if anything, it's the social ramifications that really make a difference. It's the fact that your family believes in God and still is expecting you to go to church, and you don't. Uh, it's the fact that all your friends believe in God. That kind of social repercussion can indeed be very real and can indeed be very, very difficult. And there is in, indeed frequently a period, a crisis of faith, you may call it, uh, that can be very shocking and very jarring. I remember very well when I lost my faith, and indeed it was jarring. Uh, but then again, I was 15. Being 15 was quite jarring, whether or not I lost my faith. So uh, uh, I got over it, both being 15 and the shock of no longer believing in God. Um, well, to, to go back to ethics, uh, as Dr. Connolly uh, uh, was saying I was going to talk about, there's, there's a famous line that comes up in this context from Fyodor Dostoevsky, the Russian novelist, uh, his, uh, uh, his, his, his novel, The Brothers Karamazov. He says, if there is no God, then anything is permissible. That, you know, there's, there's no reason why I can't kill you, because God will not judge me. There is no right, no wrong, no moral lawgiver. Um, so if there is no God, then anything is permissible. Now, I love Dostoevsky's writing. I think very few novelists capture the human condition as well as he is. I don't mean to be besmirching him, uh, but I do mean to be contradicting him. No, it's not. It's not the case that if there is no God, then everything is permissible. And, of course, everyone here knows it, because not a single one of you have yet killed Kirk Cameron. <laughs> I don't know, I suspect the thought has crossed some of your minds. Um, why? Why haven't you killed Kirk Cameron? Because you recognize that that's not permissible. You recognize that that's the kind of thing that's not okay. Um, He's unlisted. What's that? He's unlisted. Oh, but tra he travels enough. You can find him. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, there's ample evidence, again, uh, 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 empirical evidence, that belief in God has little to no effect at all on moral behavior. I mean, it does have some effect. Uh, on average, theists are more likely to give to charity. Uh, so th that, in that respect, can have a positive effect. But at the same time, they're also much more likely to engage in criminal activity. So it's sort of a wash in that direction. And it does have some effects, but on average, it more or less uh, 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 levels out, I, I, I would say. Um, and, and, and really, the, the point here is simply the youth of Roman Lemma. It's the same thing that Dr. Conley was talking about. Uh, even if God exists, how does that solve the problem? How exactly does God make murder wrong and make love and compassion right? There is no obvious, clear answer to this question that doesn't simply assert the very thing it's trying to prove. Um, 
uh, the, the youth of fraud dilemma really is a fatal knockdown argument against the idea that God is necessary in any way for um, for for being morality. Uh, not only is he not necessary, he's not sufficient. You can have God and still have no morality. You need something way more than simply proving God exists to prove that you can have right and wrong. Um, so yeah, I think any ex-theist will tell you uh, that the day after they lost their faith, um, they woke up the next morning and they still loved their children. They still cared about their family. They still cared about people. They still cared about their jobs. They still loved art. They still cared for music. They still uh, 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 wanted to learn about history and, and science and philosophy. All of these things still matter to them just as much as they did before they lost their faith in God. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen Julie Sweeney's uh, One Woman Act, uh, Letting Go of God, but it's really a very powerful, very moving sort of testimony to precisely this point. At first, it seemed like it was the end of the world, and then she got over it. And this seems to me to be what the vast majority of ex-theists do. They get over it, and their life goes on more or less precisely the same way as it did before. Uh, in as much as there is any change, it is the change in the social dynamics, not a change in the existentialist uh, 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 spiritual underpinnings. Um, Born-again atheists, if I can sort of you know, steal that phrase, uh, are basically the same as theists in all the ways that count except for one. They don't believe in God. But that's really all it amounts to. If the only difference between theists and atheists is that one believes in God and one doesn't believe in God, and there are really no discernible differences other than that, then I have to ask, how is that any different than the, pe the person who believes that numbers are ontologically real and the person who doesn't believe that numbers are ontologically real? Again, it is an academic distinction. Uh, all the stuff that really matters in life can make perfect sense to the atheist and the theist alike. So in closing, then, um, I want to say that we can assume that God exists, or we can assume that God does not exist. We still have the same joys to relish and the same burdens to shoulder. So, again, to, 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 to paraphrase Nietzsche, God cannot solve our problems. His non-existence or his existence, one way or the other, we still face the same existentialist issues, the, still, the fundamental deep spiritual crises. Um, so I challenge you this, if you disagree with me, and I hope at least some of you do, because philosophers love when people disagree with them, that's, that's one of the things that we thrive on. Um, uh, th those of you who are inclined to disagree with me, I challenge you. Name one thing in life, just one thing in life, that an atheist, qua atheist, an atheist as an atheist, can have that a theist cannot or vice versa, something that a theist can have in their life that the atheist cannot, beyond the obvious, beyond belief in God. Other than that, name the differences. Now again, I'm not looking for a difference between a particular theist and a particular atheist, because indeed you might be able to find particular atheists and theists where there are genuine differences. I'm talking on average. The average Joe Schmo atheist, the average Joe Schmo theist. I think you will find that they are alike in virtually all possible respects. So that means, if I am correct, and I have sold this properly, that it really doesn't matter whether or not there is a God. And that is my short case for apathyism. Thank you very much.